Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. Uh, we'll be back in just a few seconds with Chuck Collins. And please don't forget the donate button and the subscribe button and the share button and all the buttons. Be back in a second. In his book, The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to Hide Trillions, Chuck Collins writes, powerful corporate interests benefit from weak local government and badly enforced consumer protection laws and enforcement. Their efforts to block the creation of Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and their ongoing campaign to defund and weaken the agency are an indication of how the odds are stacked against the non-wealthy. The pro-wealthy tilt to our political system has enabled the wealth defense industry to gain power in its efforts to hoard and hide their clients' wealth. As a result, it becomes a parasitical appendage on the real productive economy, extracting rents and fees, not just from the wealthy, but also from enterprising sectors of the economy. Chuck Collins inherited a hefty fortune himself and was offered a place to slurp from the money river, as he calls it. Okay, you're going to find out what that's about in a minute. Instead, he decided to give much of the principle of his fortune, not just the interest, away. That, by the way, I learned is a cardinal sin amongst the wealthy, as the meaning of life itself is defined by passing on wealth to future generations. Now joining us is Chuck Collins. He's the director of the Program on Inequality and the Common Good at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he co-edits inequality.org. His new book is The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to Hide Trillions. He's a founding board member of Patriotic Millionaires. Thanks very much, Chuck. Paul, thank you for having me. All right. So so what is the Muddy River? And uh, tell us the story of how you uh, were invited to Come uh, t find your place on its banks and start slurping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I owe a debt to Kurt Vonnegut, who's one of his earliest novels, God Bless You, uh, Mr. Rosewater, was sort of about a an heir to a wealthy f dynastic fortune in Indiana who created sort of a one man uh, fire and rescue squad. And uh, he, he kind of had this perspective that he explained to one of his relatives that it's not that I'm smart or that I did anything in particular. I was just born by the banks of the Money River. I learned how to go down and slurp, you know, benefit from that flow of money. And we have all these helpers who help us drill more wells and extract more wealth than we could possibly imagine. Um, and that was certainly my circumstance. I was, I was born on uh, third base or won the lottery at birth um, as the Great grandson of the meat packer Oscar Meyer, um, and that was what got me in the, my mid twenties asking questions like, "Do I really need this inheritance? And do I want to live in a society where some people inherit so much and others have nothing?" And uh, it gave me a front row seat to this wealth defense industry that you described. That all the trusted family advisors who help you uh, sequester the wealth uh, in perpetuity, ideally. So why did you even ask such questions? I mean, most kids born into such families, their identity is formed in that culture that, you know, it's practically defend, defending wealth is patriotic. Like you call yourselves patriotic millionaires and you guys are for financial reform and higher taxes and such. But I, I, I've, you know, in the course of fundraising for nonprofits and such, you know, I've, I've met lots of wealthy people, mostly progressive, some not. But, but I know that the culture is that somehow it's rationalized, justified, defending wealth, passing it on to the future generations of your family is a noble endeavor. And, and, and that's, you grow up going to the schools, the, the, you know, private schools that are taught, this is your mission to save, you know, you're the safe savior safeguards of society and values and so on and so on but it really is all about hoarding and defending the wealth so how the heck did you break from that you know paul i it's just like who it's sort of a mystery to me too you know i mean i i i all i had all those forces around me uh it it clearly was the 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 fish that i was a fish swimming in the water of wealth and that and all those assumptions i my one theory is uh well, my mom, my mom did not grow up 
you know, with tremendous wealth. And she sort of had a critical voice that she put in my head. But I also grew up in the suburbs of Detroit in 1967 and was trying to make sense of the Detroit riots and why was it that there were these great inequalities between downtown and suburb. And of course, you know, many of us can go through life with lots of stories and justifications for these inequalities, but for some reason it didn't, it didn't quite, whatever, cracked for me. Uh, it didn't, some of the mythologies or justifications just didn't ring true. But there's other other rich kids saw the same stuff. No, I know. Uh, I, I, you know, it's how how do any of us become who we are? I, I think part of it was that uh, it was it was extreme to me the 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 divide, the gap between city and suburb, black and white, rich and poor. Uh, and when you're three or four generations down the pike, if you will, uh, the the sort of deservedness mythology starts to crack and it's kind of like what did i do that got me here not you know i understand my great grandfather but me what have i done i just i just picked my pick the right parents you know um so anyway i i wish i had a better answer for that uh but was there something specific that influenced your life like when you say you grew up in the late 60s what age are you talking about? Like the, the Vietnam War, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement? Did something kind of touch you? Well, I think I was. Uh, I think it, there wasn't one single thing, but I think that I was uh, affected by the... I was only seven in 1967. But then as thing, as time went on, you know, I did work for Catholic Relief Services. I did have a a sort of religious and faith tradition that talked about the preferential option for the poor and the sort of economic justice. I worked for Catholic Relief Services in El Salvador, so then I sort of got a global picture of the situation. So all these things sort of had a cumulative effect where the, the mythology of justification just didn't take hold in me in, in the same uh, aggressive way that it seems to capture other people's imagination. Uh, the reason why I'm pursuing this, and we're, we're going to get into the substance of your book soon, but is that, you know, we have, what, eight or nine years, maybe, in terms of climate before, you know, it's maybe a point of no return. Uh, you, know, you know, the science seems to be saying if we can't stay within the 1.5 warming, uh, uh, then you start getting a kind of runaway effect. And uh, so, so we're at a point in human history, and where if if some sections of the elites don't really get this, and I don't mean get it superficially or just get it from a point of view of trying to make some money out of it, but actually don't really get the urgency of the climate crisis and the profound inequality, and 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 and, and I have to add because people don't talk it very much, but the threat of nuclear war too, which is just everyone's in denial of. Um, there's got, you look at the level of the mass movement, the workers movement, the progressive movement. I mean, there's, it's, it's, there's stuff happening, but not at the scale that in seven, eight, nine years, it's going to be enough to change the course of government policy. So some sections of the elites have to really get this. So I'm always particularly intrigued when you meet someone who, you know, I don't know how much of your wealth you gave away, but you're, st you're still in those circles. Is there any hope that, that there's some other people like you that have some real wealth and power might actually not just understand the urgency, but actually break with, with, with doing business as usual? Yeah. Um, I have se I'm seeing what I would describe as cracks within the elite, that there are people who understand that we can't keep going down this path ecologically and economically, that it's not actually in their personal interests, uh, that, that extreme inequality undermines healthy democratic societies, will undermine the economy, and that our, they're locking us into our inability to respond to the ecological crisis. So I, I also share all of that. And I see people kind of waking up not enough, not fast enough, but I do see uh, particularly a younger under 35 generation very much questioning, you know, the the privileges and prerogatives, uh, saying things like, look, I want to um, distribute my money 
and move, put it into a, a more regenerative, healthy economy, take money out of the extractive economy. So the, and I'm even talking to wealth advisors, which is relevant to the topic of the book, who are not in the same groove of, okay, unlimited accumulation and let's just create dynasties for the next generation. They're saying, hey, you know, uh, let's let's forget about three, you know, your great, your unborn great grandchildren and passing on wealth to them. Let's try to pass on a livable planet. And in order to do that, we're going to have to move these resources to organizing, campaigning and transitioning to a new, new energy future. So I do see some hopeful cracks in that in that system. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a piece about BlackRock, uh, the big asset manager, and a lot of very wealthy people have their money in BlackRock. It gets invested for them on these index funds. And uh, Larry Fink, who's the head of BlackRock, said, you know, our, our primary responsibility is to defend the assets of our investors. But you got to say that, that it should also include defend the asses of your investors, because <laughs> If there isn't a change of course, these assets, you know, this, this generational approach to money, it's not going to mean very much. Anyway, let's 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 get into a little more into the substance of the book. Uh, so, talk a bit what what was the money river? What was your experience? And 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 a little bit of your more of your story in terms of you decided not to slurp. Well, you know, I when you're in your mid twenties, you're you're. Uh, <laughs> As I, and I, I was speaking as somebody who has three children in their twenties now, uh, you know, you're you're individ, you're creating your own identity, and I wanted to have a path that was separate than something that happened generations ago, uh, and I was uh, quite social change oriented, and really, uh, you know, concerned about. And this was even in the seventies and eighties when before we're seeing the extreme levels of inequality now, but I could just see how inequality was tearing our societies apart, how poverty and, and you know, damaged and wounded and traumatized people. Um, so that, that, that very much shaped me. Um, and, and then I saw that it was not just the wealthy individuals who were saying, oh, I want to keep this money. It was a whole infrastructure of these wealth defense industry people, tax attorneys, prof you know, the professional accountants, the wealth managers, they were all steeped in a sort of ideology around wealth accumulation, concentration, preservation, and passing it on, essentially creating these kind of inherited wealth dynasties that they measured success by how 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 little taxes their clients could pay and how much accumulated generation in and generation out. And I, I saw that as fundamentally counter to a healthy, democratic, socially mobile form of capitalism. I mean, I just I just saw that that was going to undermine, you know, we we're going to become more of an oligarchy than than a healthy, socially mobile, democratic society. And of course, the, the the this wealth defense industry, because they have the quote expertise, wind up writing the tax laws, which are, uh, you know, first of all, you need forces you the wealthy and even not so wealthy to pay them to make some sense of how you file your tax return. But of course, the laws are written in a way that if you can afford these these expertise, you can avoid much, if not all your tax. Yeah. And and, and I would focus in and say, you know, I'm not talking about people who have a, a you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars and are just simply plan, planning so they don't run out of money before they die. I'm talking about people in the the top one tenth of one percent starting at 30 million and up. These are the folks who are hiring the expertise to, you know, really sequester their wealth in a, an extraordinary way. Um, and, you know, it's, it, they have, they using, they're using their power. They'll, they'll tell you, by the way, the people in the wealth defense industry will say, we're just helping our clients obey the law. But in fact, uh, as I point out in my book, they're helping write the law. They're helping write the regulations. They're helping to fend off oversight and regulation. They're actively engaged in manipulating the rules uh, that they say that they're helping their clients obey. So they're they're an active class that's trying to make the wealthy a protected class. Now, one of the major ways that wealth is hidden from taxes, even though supposedly the tax laws are, are supposed to catch this, is is offshore 
and all various kinds of tax havens. So how, how does that work practically? Because I thought uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, American tax laws captures all your income offshore or not. Well, actually, starting in 2009, that began to, began to be more true, meaning that uh, the Obama administration uh, pushed to enter into treaties with other countries requiring more transparency and disclosure of institutions where U.S. citizens were parking their money. We didn't reciprocate, however, uh, meaning that you can be a billionaire bringing and bring your money here to the United States and, you, and the U.S. isn't reporting to your authorities. So that's one of the things that's changed is the United States has become kind of a magnet for global kleptocratic capital. Um, and, and people who have stolen money from their own people or your Russian oligarch or whatever, you're, you're bringing your money here because we're now the weak link in the global transparency system. Um, and so, the, and, and then that's one of the reasons why I think you're starting to see more luxury real estate owned by international interests, more land purchases by international wealth, people buying up art and other asset classes. The wealthy around the world are looking to park their money in the United States because we're a, a stable, regulated marketplace, um, and it's a good place to hide your wealth. So, in fact, they're avoiding taxes in their home countries because the U.S. doesn't cooperate with those countries. But, but to what extent uh, has it gotten more difficult for the wealth, American wealthy to use tax havens? I, I mean, I guess the, the, the Panama Papers and, and what that involved was that that was essentially illegal parking of money offshore, and 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 is a lot of this actually illegal? And how in your book, uh, the offshore, it talks about trillions of dollars being uh, hidden offshore. The Panama Papers, which came out like six years, five years ago, um, really were focused on shell companies and the role of anonymous shell corporations that were parked in different places of the world, and it really shook up primarily European. Powers. Uh, a number of governments, leaders had to resign. The president of Iceland, David Cameron, the prime minister of the UK, they were all implicated in the Panama Papers, whereas U.S. wealthy folks were less implicated. Part of what's going on is the super rich in the United States are keep finding ways to keep their money onshore using shell companies and trusts and other devices. So they're, they're, there's less need to go offshore some of what they can do to sequester and hide money they can do here onshore. And in terms of the question of whether it's legal or not, it's all kind of skirting and dancing along the law, uh, you know, but some of it is not the traditional criminally obtained money uh, in the U.S. It's just people who are avoiding taxes and lawsuits and accountability. And so they're creating these trusts and other mechanisms. And how does the trust protect them? You're, you're talking essentially like private foundations? They, they are in a sense. I mean, a typical trust and it's a, and it's a medieval ownership structure. Uh, it's really a vestige of feudalism. Uh, you have the grantor. So, you know, I'm going to create a trust for you, Paul. You'll be the beneficiary and we'll get our friend Lewis to be the trustee. So I'm going to create the trust put the money into it, you're going to someday be the beneficiary and receive the money. From an ownership and tax point of view, we've just put that money into a form of a kind of a limbo state. You know, is it my money? No, I gave it to the trust. Is it your money? No, you haven't received it yet. Is it Lewis's money? No, he's the trustee. Who has the wealth? And that limbo status is part of how They'll explain to tax authorities, well, nobody really owns this wealth. And then now they've created what, what they call dynasty trusts, where they've suspended the rule of against perpetuities, which limits the lifespan of a trust so that they can exist for centuries and into perpetuity. So people are putting money into trusts where the beneficiaries might be generation, 10 generations down the pike. Uh, and and so huge amounts of wealth will grow inside these trusts outside the reach of taxation or kind of transparency and accountability. Which is, as I was saying in the introduction, which I picked up from your book, uh, you know, once you have millions and millions of dollars to live on, uh, the point of the accumulation of this wealth can't be 
anything to do with your data, you know, your standard of living, it's either because of the power it gives you, um, but even more so, because most billionaires, multi, multi millionaires, are not particularly politically active, I don't think. They donate to a candidate here and there. They like that their phone call gets picked up when they want something from an elected politician. But the, they don't spend much, most of them don't spend much of their life worrying about what's happening in the world or unless it very directly affects their economic interests. Uh, they are very much tied up with this idea that they're going to make sure their kids are looked after and their kids' kids and so on. So these trusts are really in line with their mission in life, which is to you know, pay it forward to their future generations. But it means the fortunes go untaxed. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the desire to have immortality or to, to protect the, the, the legacy in a very narrow bloodline family tree sense. Um, and in order to do that, uh, you want to pay as little taxes as possible. You want to avoid transfer taxes like the estate tax, gift taxes, generation skipping taxes. These are all taxes that these trusts are, are very specifically designed to sort of circumvent. And without that, you are seeing essentially dynastic accumulations and they become a form of power. Uh, it's not just about having agency in a good life. It's about being able to shape the environment that, that, that you live in, including tax policy. Um, so it's a form of power that, that is counter to, you know, having a society that we're, you know, in a healthy democratic society with a fair tax system, wealth, wealthy dynastic families would go from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three or four generations, right? The whole idea being, you know, one generation maybe creates a, a useful something, whether it's bologna or MS-DOS or whatever. Four generations from now, because you've had children, because you've been paying your taxes, maybe because you're sharing your money through charity, the money is dispersed. That's sort of the natural order of things in a democratic society with a functioning tax system. What the, what the wealth defense industry has done is essentially arrest that normal process of dispersal and is seeing, now we're seeing dynastically wealthy families, the Waltons, the Kochs, the Mars family, et cetera, seeing their wealth accelerate over generations. Uh, so that's what we should sit up and take notice because we're seeing almost feudal-like dynastic conditions emerging. Now, is that new? I mean, wasn't certainly some of the great fortunes from the late 19th, early 20th century, Rockefellers and, and, and such, that generation, uh, they were very dynastic as well, were they not? Yeah. Uh, what what happened though is in 1916 we passed the progressive income tax. We passed uh, uh, the inheritance tax, the estate tax. The, that actually did put a meaningful break on the buildup of these concentrations of wealth and power. So it's funny you do see some dynastically wealthy families that are still around. Then you see a 50, 60 year period where there were no new wealth dynasties created, where wealth did disperse over generations because there was a functioning progressive tax system. And now we see, I think what we're seeing now is the emergence of the next generation of Gilded Age dynasties in the, in the current period. So um, it, it has always been that way. And there was this 40, 50 year period where there weren't these great dynastic fortunes created. The uh, In your book, you quote this guy, Khan, as saying only fools pay the estate tax. I, I've always thought the estate tax, you know, is, is one of the only ways to get at this accumulated uh, aristocratic wealth. Um, but some people even, you know, on the left, uh, liberal economists say it, it doesn't really work because they f find so many ways out of paying it. I mean, what, what, where are we at now with the estate tax? And is there a way to have an effective estate tax? Well, uh, it's a really good question. And, and actually, I sort of cut my political teeth in 1999 when George W. Bush campaigned on eliminate the death tax, and he did a whole campaign to eliminate the estate tax. 
and I was organizing wealthy people to defend the estate tax. And I got a call from this guy, Bill Gates Sr., the father of the founder of Microsoft. And I thought it was a crank call, you know. But he was, uh, hey, I, this is Bill Gates, the, fo the founder of Microsoft's father. He says, I, I think the estate tax is an all-American tax. It's how we defend meritocratic social mobility. You know, I'm willing to help with this campaign. And he and I and, you know, lots of others work to defend the estate tax. What happened is it's become more porous. It's become, first, they've raised the wealth exemptions up. So today... The, the, the tax exempts your, the first $11.5 million of wealth or about $23 million for a couple. So the exemption is far high up. That's, that's actually not a problem. The problem is primarily that people are using these aggressive planning techniques so that only morons pay the estate tax, meaning only people who are not hiring professionals and creating these trusts. Um, I now think we need to retain the estate tax close down some of these loopholes and look at, at adding an inheritance tax where taxes also are levied on the recipients of big inheritances. Let's say if you know you receive $2 million on tax, but above that you start to pay some form of tax on inherited wealth, just like another form of income. Um, I, I think you, we need to do both those things because there's now so much wealth that's been put outside the reach of the estate tax, that the way to capture that is now when it comes to the beneficiaries. Yeah, I, I once did a uh, wrote an article uh, about during the uh, protests in Wisconsin when they uh, occupied the buildings in, Ma in Madison. And, and I looked at the, the uh, Wisconsin deficit and the state debt and I looked at if you went back to 1990 levels of estate taxes um, and you assume that there'd be a certain amount of avoidance through various kinds of loopholes. But in terms of the actual money that could have been raised at 1990 level estate taxes, just from the people on the Forbes billionaire list who live in Wisconsin, which was like, I think, seven or eight, just those fortunes. Uh, you would have paid off the entire debt of Wisconsin, the deficit and the entire debt. Uh, of course, now, with I think Wisconsin doesn't even have an estate tax anymore. Many, many states have dropped it completely. Um, and uh, But uh, th there seems to be a, a lack of wanting to focus on that. As, and I, 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 even amongst, as I say, some progressives, which they say, no, just focus on income. But then you don't, you don't get where the real money is. Uh, well, I, I completely agree. And actually, I do, I do think there is more appetite for looking at the wealth side of the equation. I mean, I think Senator Elizabeth Warren's proposal to levy an annual wealth tax uh, is wildly popular. You know, it's, you know, wealth over 50 million, you start to pay a 2% annual tax. When you hit a billion, you pay 3%. Uh, it raises, you know, it's $3 trillion over 10 years. I mean, it's like... 60, 70 percent of voters, including Republicans and independents, all like this idea. So I think people understand income. Yes, there are great income inequalities, but the real deep entrenched inequalities now are in wealth and assets. You know, you have like 40 percent of U.S. households that have like zero or like very little financial reserves. And then you have billionaires who've seen their wealth go up during the pandemic by one point six billion trillion dollars, you know, in 14 months. So more, I think people are getting schooled in the power and importance of taxing wealth and that that's going to be a key ingredient, how we, how we pay for some of the stuff that we need to do. Is part of the problem of getting such laws, and I, I just want to say again, there were such laws after World War II. Uh, what was the state tax during Eisenhower years was like 90% or something? It was, it was steeply progressive. Um, in, under FDR 1936-37, they raised the estate tax up into the 90 percentile. So you almost had a 100 percent wealth tax, an inheritance tax above a very high threshold. I mean, it would have been 10 to 12 you know, million in today's dollars. The important point here, at Teddy Roosevelt supported this idea. The, the Sanders, Bernie Sanders has an estate tax reform bill 
where you have a graduated rate structure. So you have $20 million, you pay at the 40% rate. Uh, any, any wealth over $20 million, you pay a 40% estate tax. But that you step it up to 60%, 70% when you're talking about a billion dollars. You start to slow and deconcentrate these, these sort of democracy distorting levels of wealth and power. And that was one of the purposes, always one of the purposes of the estate tax. It wasn't just about revenue. It was about decent, de, you know, deconcentrating wealth and power. Yeah, I, I know I've talked to, uh, you know, right wing libertarians who we probably disagree on many, many things. Sometimes we agree on foreign policy things, but but some of them do support the wealth tax that this is, you know, the same thing point you're making that. If you want any form of democracy, you can't have an aristocracy. And you wind up with that when you have this great inherited wealth. But, but as part of the reason this discussion doesn't get more prominence is that this wealth defense industry you're talking about, the individuals, the lawyers, the accountants, and all the rest, are also to a large extent the people who are the bundlers of political funding for the parties. And so they have an inordinate direct connection to the uh, uh, whole political process and their big mission is defend the wealth. Uh, Paul, you said it perfectly. I mean, to understand this is a class. They are not as wealthy as their clients. They're not oligarchs, but they align themselves with their interests and they use their considerable networks and power. I mean, think about the trust and estate a section of the American Bar Association or the family office industry in the United States with two to 3,000 family offices or, you know, accounting groups and other sort of wealth management networks. These folks use their power to fend off oversight and to protect their clients' interests. So it's not just a couple, you know, it's not just 700 billionaires. It's ninety, hundred thousand dollars of professional people in the top 5 to 10% of incomes who use their, their clout to advance those interests. You, you said $100,000. You meant $100,000. I'm sorry, 100,000 professionals. And that's, professionals. That's, that's just helping wealthy individuals. There's a whole other group uh, overlapping, but, but uh, a larger group that work with, uh, a cup, say, let's say a couple hundred transnational corporations on their tax shenanigans. Uh, so now we're now we're probably talking two hundred to three hundred thousand people who get up every morning, and help the biggest corporations and the richest people in the society uh, hoard their wealth uh, in perpetuity. It's like lawyers who defend the mafia; they can justify to themselves so it, everyone deserves a fair trial, so I can make my living defending the mafia. These guys say, "Well, they're following the law, so I can help them preserve their wealth, even if it's destroying." society and the planet. Okay, here, just to show you how much I am not in that class. I never heard of such a thing called a family office until I started reading your book. What is a family office? A family office is, uh, and, and many people during the pandemic think, oh yeah, I got a family office now. Uh, you know, I'm working, I'm yeah, telecommuting work over here. Home. <laughs> I said, no, no, exactly, no, no, yeah. That's it's very different. Uh, a family office is when uh, a, a wealthy family brings the wealth defense industry services in-house. So instead of going over to Fidelity and going to a law firm, they bring the lawyer, the wealth management professionals in-house. They still might contract for services. Uh, but typically it's families with about $250 million or more. Um, and it's it's not a surprise you haven't heard of them. They, they're they not exactly advertising their, their existence. Um, one interesting current event, though, is, uh, you know, so family offices are probably they've grown tremendously in the last couple of decades. There's probably, a, you know, a couple thousand family offices in 1983. Now there's an estimated 10,000 family offices globally. Uh, their mission is capital preservation and succession. Gener you know, getting as much money to the next generation as possible. So they're in the dynasty building business. They they are in the tax efficiency or tax minimization business. That's inherent to who they are. 
Um, in in after the uh, 2009 economic meltdown, uh, as part of the Dodd Frank legislative process overseeing the financial system, setting up some guardrails, et cetera, family offices lobbied very hard to be left alone. We're just families minding our own money. And to some extent, you could sort of make that case. Look, they're qual, you know, they're 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 qualified investors. They're wealthy. If they lose a little bit of money, it's not the end of the world. They're not going to be bamboozled by fraudsters, etc. Uh, so all of a sudden, you saw saw these hedge funds converting and turning themselves into family office, Soros, Appaloosa, you know, uh, and one of them was this guy Bill Huang who started something called Archilego, Archegos, which was uh, a... Yeah, we, heard, we heard of him We've recently. We've heard of him recently. Well, guess what? That was a family office. It was an unregulated family office. So Remind, remind people what happened. So Archegos was uh, you know, uh, an investor who brought, borrowed money from you know, Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley and lost about $10 billion of those two institutions' money because he entered into these high, highly leveraged uh, kind of financial swaps. So complex financial transactions. But here's an example where this family office isn't just a wealthy person losing their money. They lost a lot, some other people's money too. And therefore, we should probably bring them under some form of oversight. Um so that's an example where family offices are now kind of moving to the adventurous end of finance, the speculative end of finance. So my my little retort to that is you take some billionaires, you take unregulated pools of trillions of dollars in family offices, you put it together with a pandemic uh, speculative financial situation and what could possibly go wrong, right? Uh, and I would say, unless we bring these family offices, which manage somewhere in the six to seven trillion dollar of wealth level, unless we bring them under some kind of oversight, they are going to be the the sort of corner of the shadow financial system that still sort of exists coming out of the the economic meltdown. Um, so, and just for perspective, all the wealth in global hedge funds is about three point four trillion dollars. So we're looking at a private unregulated sector twice as big as the hedge fund sector that no one's really keeping an eye on. And maybe the at least the size of a quarter of the American GDP, if not even a little more than that. Um, you, you made a really interesting point in the book um, about how the U.S. as a, as a tax haven for uh, billionaires outside of the United States, a lot of which is criminal money, avoiding uh, accountability in, in, the, in their own countries, uh, come to the U.S. because it's become a, a safe haven, a tax haven, but that it, it gets embroiled and interwoven with big American money. I mean, the obvious example of that is Trump, uh, where the you know, allegations uh, are, but are, are pretty strong about Russian oligarchs uh, buying all kinds of condom condos from him in other ways, uh, cleaning their money through, through Trump. But I'm sure Trump's not unique in this, and you seem to be suggesting that in the book. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, as I was saying, I think that there's, the U.S. is particularly attractive as a place to bring wealth. So if you, let's say you are a Russian oligarch, or you're a Chinese billionaire and you need to get your money out of China because you think the government might, you know, appropriate it, or you are a dictator in the global South in some kind of mineral rich country. And you've been sort of squirreling away and extracting bribes and, you know, taking the wealth of your people, stealing wealth from your own people. Where do you take it? Right. You need to get it out of your country. You need to get it into some form of anonymous ownership. You need to, run it through some kind of offshore bank. But once you've sort of laundered it, uh, you want to bring it to a stable market. And the United States is, uh, you know, beckoning. Um, and this is where, uh, Paul, you have to get into your sort of inner billionaire here. You've got a billion dollars. You need to kind of spread that around, right? You can't have all of it sitting in one place. You can't have it over in the equity markets. You can't, you want to have 
your money parked in a lot of different asset classes. Real estate is very attractive because you can buy real estate all over the country, all in Canada, every places. You can buy luxury real estate. So we're seeing this, the, the, this incredible wave of global money coming in and buying up U.S. luxury real estate. Um, anonymously in some cases, you know, using a Delaware shell company or the like. Um, we just, there's a, there's a fight between two factions of the Saudi monarchy going on. And the previous fa family members took about 3.5 billion out of Saudi Arabia. And, you know, they're trying to get it back. Well, where is that money? It's in real estate in New York, Toronto, and Boston. We, I could, I could give you a tour of, of 10 condos owned by, you know, Saudi, Saudi money. Uh, is that illegal money? Not necessarily. Well, it depends who's in charge over there. You know, they might say, well, that was illegally taken, which looks quite likely, actually. So, the you know, art is another place. People love to, you know, park money in art. So part of it is you, you're not even looking to buy real estate to invest in its going up in value or renting it. You're purchasing it because you think it's going to hold value. So if you think about your whole billion, Paul, you got your adventurous money over here going into Bill Huang's family office investment fund, and you've got your stable, you know, just trying to hold value assets over here and, and the like. So it, it it's changed the American economy in weird ways. And for many of us who live in cities uh, where the cost of housing and land have just been driven up, it's another factor that's contributing to the affordable housing crisis. Yeah, I know. Right now I'm in Toronto. I go back and forth between U.S. and Canada. And of course, in Toronto, Vancouver, the condo market's gone insane. Everyone keep predicting it's going to crash because there's just more, it seems like there's a heck of a lot more condos than there are people. But the money coming in, especially from Hong Kong and from China, uh, again, parking it, but it, but it, it is inflate. I mean, in this way, they, in a sense, they're making money out of it because so much money's pouring in the, the, the housing values keep going up and up and up. And uh, so maybe the wealthy are making money out of it, but housing is getting increasingly un unaffordable for people. In Vancouver, they, they found it was just hallowing out neighborhoods that uh, wasn't just luxury condos. It was single family houses and the money was coming in and buying up, you know, half the half the houses in a neighborhood they even had companies that uh made it look like someone was living in the house you know they'd put up a pumpkin at halloween and a, some holiday lights at december you know to, but these were empty ghost town neighborhoods and it you know there all of a sudden there's no foot traffic there's nobody going to the mom and pop store in the corner uh and and toronto's response i'm sorry vancouver and british columbia's response was to tax vacancies tax, uh, discourage foreign ownership, um, levy anti-speculation taxes on transfers over a certain threshold. Uh, they were trying to contain the destructive impact. I don't know if you've done any work on this. This, to some extent, jives with the issue of how this is a corrupting influence, this kind of international money coming in. Uh, but but there's a, a section of the mafia uh, I, I don't remember its name right now, but it's uh, it's originally came from Calabria, I guess, uh, southern Italy, and uh, it's actually now headquartered in Toronto. The, the the family leaders are here, and according to a few news reports, uh, the family's global operations are generating sixty billion dollars a year. Um, and uh, in the article, I, I believe it might have been Reuters article, but at any rate, it, more money than the it, they're making more profit than McDonald's and Deutsche Bank put together. <laughs> Where's all that money going? Obviously not getting taxed, but but are some of the same tax avoidance structures creating money laundering opportunities? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the money is not sitting on some little Caribbean island. It is in active markets. Uh, it's in real property. It's in art, jewelry, other forms of cryptocurrency. Now, uh, all you know, it's it's spread over a lot of probably nation states and markets, um, 
And, you know, when you have that level of wealth, you are taking portions of it and putting it into the, the casino, uh, the, the not, not, not the Las Vegas casino. Well, actually, but the, actually, by, actually, actually, actually lit. <laughs> No, but actually, that is the probably number one way to launder money are casinos. So that's, that's the right. raison d'etre of cas- <laughs> I made a film in Las Vegas, and the insiders were telling me the consumer stuff is just sidelined. It's the the, re- the money laundering is what the business is about. Yeah. Well, so yeah, there's there's the real casinos, and then there's sort of the speculative part of the financial markets, the casino financial sector, and that's where you have huge amounts of wealth trying to drive high returns. And that's where you, you know, that's how we got into trouble in 2008, 2009. You had, you know, 20% of the wealth controlled by the richest 1% chasing really high returns and saying, you know, let's move this money out into the mortgage sector. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do some deals. And in fact, the real economy couldn't sustain or support those levels of return. Uh, so it, it creates volatility. I think that's that's the reason why we should care is it, it contributes to volatility in the marketplace when so much wealth is chasing high returns. Uh, why don't you elaborate that? Because that's one of the more important points, I think, in your book is that it's not just this is unfair. It's not just that it's unequal. It actually distorts the entire economy in a way that it just becomes increasingly parasitical. And, and I think if you want to understand the Trump phenomena, of course, disillusionment among sections of the working class, yeah, but they aren't the ones who created Trump. Let's you know, remember the financing of Trump was through Robert Mercer, the hedge fund billionaire, quantitative uh, trader that's uh, completely parasitical, and Sheldon Adelson, who, you know, whose money's out of casinos in Vegas and uh, Macau. I mean, the most parasitical sectors of this financial economy are the ones that created Trump. Yeah, I think that that's a uh, to understand that there's sort of this extractive economy that's trying to hoover up as much wealth from different aspects of the economy, the real economy. It's parasitical on the healthy real economy. It's 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 extracting value. And that that is the the organized class that obviously push for Trump. They just want to keep the band going. You know, they just want to keep the party rolling here for as long as it can run. Uh, How much, how much can the parasitical economy extract from the real economy before the party's over? Um, And the wealth defense industry is part of what creates kind of the, the protections and the, the, you know, anonymous shell companies, uh, an anonymously owned real estate trusts that have no, clear beneficiaries. Uh, you know, these are the tools. Uh, Sheldon Adelson, he used something called grant or retained annuity trusts to he had like $8 billion. He tried to, he passed on to his children, avoiding about two to $3 billion in estate taxes using these 30 various trust forms. We sort of know some of these information thanks to leaks and very good investigative reporting. But for the re- for the most part, we don't know it. We don't know how this is working because it's there's so many layers of protection and anonymous activity that we just can't possibly know. We learn a few things periodically when there's a leak, when the Panama Papers leak, when the Paradise Papers leak, when somebody gets a divorce and they have to disclose what they actually have. But for the most part, we're in the dark as to what's really going on. Now, as far as I understand it, very little was done about this during the Obama administration. Certainly, uh, you know, the financial fraud that went on, nobody went to jail. Uh, is there any sense that it, the Biden administration will, will get any more serious about any of this? No, it's interesting. I mean, Biden obviously represented the state of Delaware for 36 years in the Senate, the state of Delaware being the supreme weak link in the secrecy jurisdiction. And yet, over the last couple of years, he's been pretty outspoken about cracking down on global money laundering. Uh, I think that there's there are people in the administration who are really trying to rebuild the oversight capacity of the Internal Revenue Service and of the Treasury Department and the Securities Exchange Commission. They understand that the oversight 
the cops on the beat have been depleted. I mean, you're more likely to be audited by the IRS for using the earned income credit, which is a tax break that working class folks use, yeah. than if you're using one of these fancy dancy trusts. Uh, and so the since 2010, the IRS has been decimated. They've lost like 18,000 staff, but they've lost the expertise to follow the money. It takes a certain amount of sophistication to understand these complex transactions and deals and trusts and which ones are bogus and which ones are legitimate. And that's that's completely missing right now. So I do think there's a recognition like when, if we want to restore any progressivity to the tax code, we have to rebuild the oversight function. Um, you know, he's proposing investing 80 billion over 10 years to rebuild the IRS. Uh, you know, it's absolute, and, and there's pretty broad support for that. You know, if you go outside of a few howling, crazy Republicans who are, you know, saying, well, this is going to imp impede on people's privacy. But otherwise, we're talking about just obeying the existing laws here, getting people to obey the existing laws. The uh, the thing with the existing laws is even if they tried, a single case against a big fortune could cost tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the talent they're up against, uh, you know, clearly the majority of people that are in the uh, wealth defense industry get paid extremely well. And why would you go into government when you can go there? And I'm, I'm certainly, there's some talented people in government too, but Jesus, when you can make 20, 30, 50 times the salary. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the way the laws are, they're, they're even if they were attempts to implement uh, implement them, it's almost impossible to do it on a scale and the number of cases they'd have to have. I mean, you talked about thousands of home offices. I mean, every one of them could be a case. Doesn't there have to be a more radical approach, like it, like just outlaw these trusts, like a big sweeping kind of change? Uh, because I, I just can't imagine, even if you throw billions at it, if, uh, billions seems like, you know, a, a teacup worth of uh, resources compared to what it would really take to to face, deal with the wealth, deal with the tax avoidance, and and most importantly, the political power all that wealth has. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you're you're absolutely right in that the IRS is completely outgunned by this wealth defense industry. Um, but there's there's I would say there's four, four things. There's four things that I take heart in one. There is there is a movement for enforcement, and that rebuilding that capacity. Second, at the end of last year, Congress passed and actually Trump signed something called the Corporate Transparency Act, which would require corporations to disclose who their real beneficial owners are to an arm of the Treasury Department, FinCEN, Financial Crime Enforcement Network. Now we're in the process of fighting over the regulations of that. But that bill had Republican support, strong support from law enforcement. Remember, law enforcement is as frustrated as anybody having to deal with these uh, money laundering systems because they hit the walls all the time. You know, oh, Delaware Limited Liability Company, end of search, right? So they want disclosure and transparency. What you say is exactly the position I would say is this certain trusts should be banned. Certain kinds of transactions should be outlawed. The IRS does have a system for what they call posting listed transactions, which is basically saying, sure, you can do this transaction, but you will be audited. And that discourages its use. Um, and if we, you know, Senator Bernie Sanders as part of the um, his estate tax reform bill has a bunch of these provisions to shut down some of these uh, shell games. Um, how did that happen? Disgruntled members of the wealth defense industry have come over to our side. Uh, there are defectors. There are people who, at the end of their professional careers, have said, what have I done for humanity? All I've done is help the richest people in the world get more richer and powerful. I'm going to now devote the rest of my life to shutting that system down. And that's part of my work is I'm trying to organize more and more of these people. Every time I do a podcast or a conversation like this, somebody emails me and says, I'm 64 years old. 
I, I'm ready to do something different. I want to help my fellow human being. And so there are cracks emerging in this wealth defense system. We're even getting rich people to tell their advisors, stop the games, stop it. I'm, I, I, I need to pay my fair share of taxes. Stop creating these tax dodges. Um, the final step is we rejoin the family of nations. We go create treaties with the uh, European nations and uh, starting with uh, corporate minimum income tax treaty that the G20 is going to be talking about in the next couple months. So you can start to see the path to closing and shutting down this hidden wealth system. Enforcement, transparency, outlawing certain kinds of transactions and trusts, global cooperation and treaties, and uh, and getting as many people from the wealth defense industry to bring their talents to the enforcement side. Um, you do that in a couple of years, it's game over for this hidden wealth system. <laughs> well, that's a big if. Well, well and I also, think you got to you got to you got to add a you got to add a serious estate tax with real teeth because if you don't break up the big fortunes, yeah, that's true. Uh, you won't it won't go very far. Well, think about if the U.S. and the U.K. with its sphere of influence and its traditional Commonwealth nations legal system, which still is under the oversight of the Privy Council, this vestige of colonial power. But if they, if if the U.S. and the uh, U.K. came together and said, "We're going to raise global standards," because there are social movements in our societies pushing for that, how long is it going to take before Belize and the Cook Islands and the British Virgin Islands cave? Right? They only have these tiny little wealth defense industries. They're powerful, influential, but when the U.K. and the U.S. saying, "Hey, do you want to be part of global trade arrangements with us?" Do you want to have global tourism exchanges? Do you want to participate in the global financial system? Here's the here's the uh, the price of entry. You have to abide by these rules. Well, you're going to need a people's movement at an enormous scale, and a president somewhere at the very least along the lines of a Bernie Sanders and a Congress that goes along with him. Uh, on the other hand, if we don't have all of that. Uh, we humans ain't going to be around an organized society for much longer. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, play out the current trajectory of both inequality and, and ecological catastrophe. Uh, yeah, I think we have five to 10 years to step up the the pace of human transformation, transition. We need to sort of start turning the corner, whether it's on carbon emissions but also on these concentrations of wealth and power. Um, and that's why I'm very grateful to, to be able to talk to you and just kind of put, have this conversation because I think this is the conversation. Uh, and and I, I'm finding people are, they, they understand, they're kind of like, well, I always knew the rich had a lot of power and that they had their own set of rules, but I didn't understand that there was this sort of support structure there and that that can be a pressure point for change. Right, because these are human beings, uh, you know. And I end I end the book by giving a commencement address, a mock commencement address. Although it's not too late for the Harvard Business School to invite me to give it on May twenty seventh, but I give a talk to younger people who are very skilled, have all kinds of options in terms of what their careers are. And my message to them is: don't work for the billionaires. Don't work for the wealth defense industry. Don't use your one and only precious life, as the poet Mary Oliver says, to help the rich get richer. Help us rebuild the commonwealth and, um, you know, help us build healthy communities and more egalitarian societies. Don't use your talents to help the wealth hoarders sequester more. Uh, and I'm, I find younger people are very receptive to that and are very much rethinking their vocation when it comes to this work. All right. Thanks very much for joining me, Chuck. Thanks, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. And please don't forget uh, the donate button because we can't do this without you. And subscribe and share and all of that kind of stuff. <laughs>